Welcome to American Dream. I'm Cynthia McKinney. Our host today, our topic today is the U.S. economy and the bankruptcy of General Motors. Joining us in the studio, we have Patrice Hill from the Washington Times, George Eads, formerly of General Motors, and joining us by phone, we have Diane Feely, of an American Axel retiree and a proud union activist. Let's go directly to our Michael Moore article that's entitled, Goodbye GM. Michael Moore writes, it is with sad irony that the company which invented planned obsolescence, the decision to build cars that would fall apart after a few years so that the customer would then have to buy a new one, has now made itself obsolete. George, what did the company do right and what did the company do wrong? Well, there's plenty of blame to go around. Uh, you can start either at the top of the, um, I think the top management and particularly the board of directors um, basically lost sight of the fact that the job of the company was to produce products that people want at prices they could afford. Uh, when people say that GM was an American icon, I think uh, people began to believe that, more of an icon than a, than a, a, a business. And you moving down, uh, there were, there were problems at middle management level, a lot of competition among divisions and rather than against the other companies. Mm. And uh, then going down to the, uh, to the labor uh, situation, the, um, the levels of wages and benefits once General Motors stopped growing uh, became unsustainable. It's, it's a bit like um, the U.S. and its Social Security system. As long as the economy is growing at a reasonably rapid pace, you can make promises that for the future that you can keep. But if you start shrinking, you can't do that. And so uh, I think from management on down, they never realized that. So what you're saying basically is that there were divisions inside the company and they were pitted against each other? Uh, well, when Alfred Sloan uh, basically put the modern General Motors together, uh, it was uh, set up so that there were multiple divisions, Chevrolet, Pontiac, Buick, GMC, and they basically each were slotted to compete against another company, like Chevrolet competed against Ford, a Cadillac competed against Lincoln, that sort of stuff. Uh, as General Motors got bigger and more bureaucratic, each of the GM divisions, like Chevrolet, Cadillac and all, almost wanted to become a full-line producer themselves, and they began to compete partly for customers, but also for resources within the company. Because, for example, you can only build so many new cars, and particularly after the technology shifted from the old kind where you just put a body on a frame, that was pretty simple and you could change it fairly expense, inexpensively to the kind we've had for the last 30 years where the, where the whole structure of the car supports the, supports the car. The cost of multiple, multiple versions goes very much higher and so you're betting maybe half a billion dollars on each new platform. So everything becomes a lot more bureaucratic, a lot more fighting, infighting, and uh, the company uh, basically refused to acknowledge or refused to see that that was going to sap its strength. Wow. Patrice, uh, what George describes, is it possible that this could be um, across many other sectors of the economy as well? Is this a phenomenon of corporations then? Well, I wouldn't say that exactly the same thing that's occurred at GM is occurring elsewhere. Uh, GM is kind of a unique uh, company in the world with a unique and, uh, and very venerable history. And the way it got the way it is is, is sort of, uh, we were talking earlier about newspapers, uh, for example. I don't think there's anything comparable to a GM in the newspaper business. Um, 
So uh, it, New York it, Times. Maybe you would yeah. say, okay, uh, you know, but uh, GM really was is unique in that it's such a major, uh, ma always been at one time was the largest manufacturer in the world and and uh, a major major employer in which jobs throughout the economy are dependent on the output of GM and so I think it was just deemed too big to fail. Whatever the reason for its problems, uh, the government felt it had to step in and try to help uh, to preserve those jobs, I think is primarily what it is, and try to preserve that very significant piece of the economy. Diane, you're there in Michigan. What, in your opinion, did General Motors do right, and what did General Motors do wrong? Well, I'd like to speak about the wrongs, uh, which I think everybody else did also. Uh, I would say, first of all, GM demanded an auto-centric uh, uh, transportation system rather than a mass, mass transit system. It stopped manufacturing buses. It also overbuilt facilities and sold off its park plants, and I think the reason it did both of those was to uh, try to get workers in one plant uh, competing with workers in another plant, we call that whipsawing, to lower our wages and benefits. Now, wages and benefits represent less than 10% of the total cost, and yet that's what they've been slashing. And so at GM, uh, we now have a situation where 90% of the workers uh, who were employed uh, 30 years ago have been totally uh, uh, represented by only 10 percent, only 10 percent of the workforce is left. In addition to that, it didn't build the electric car, uh, which you can see very dramatically in the movie, uh, Who Killed the Electric Car? Instead, it decided to build SUVs and trucks, which were not fuel efficient, but made $10,000 profit per, per vehicle. This then left the middle-sized and small-sized cars to the transplants, which then moved ahead as it successfully um, worked in uh, manufacturing uh, what people actually wanted. I would say it also didn't lobby for single-payer health care. Uh, the, the corporations like GM uh, say that uh, they have, they're spending too much on pensions and uh, health care benefits, especially for those of us who have retired, we're the so-called legacy costs. That is, we haven't died fast enough. And I would say, if that's the problem, let's go for single-payer health care, which would be a more efficient system and actually a better system. Uh, likewise with pensions. Let's build a Social Security system which can take care of retirees so that we're not dependent on our employer for our health care and our pensions. So that's my list, my short list against uh, uh, GM. George, did you have anything to do with the decision not to uh, produce the electric car? Uh, no, and I think that that's, a, that's a, um, something that's a sort of a, it's a, it's, it, it tends to f move you away from what you really should be focused on. L let me say one thing, correct one thing. When I was at General Motors from 86 through 94, uh, we supported, and I was involved in supporting uh, national health care insurance. They recognized very much exactly the, the problem it would cause, uh, the, the problem, the health care costs, and uh, the company uh, very much um, was interested in it. We weren't successful, but we did support it. Now, the origins of essentially employer-provided health care go back to World War II, when uh, the government had wage and price controls and uh, they couldn't raise wages and so they began to offer benefits which they could do mm -hmm. and that sort of got us off track into the current system we've got now so the you know, health care thing is fine in terms of the electric car the electric car at some point in the future once they get decent batteries may, may be a good thing but the EV1 was not a car that anyone would buy in any large large volumes, and we can talk about that later. Well, actually, 